So one of the main questions that underlies what we do in the forum is what does it mean to live well? So living well not only includes material comfort, although the necessities and conveniences of life do contribute to tranquility and happiness, uh, but it also includes the freedom to lay out our and follow our own aspirations. You know, we might qualify that with, you know, within the bounds of, of justice and benevolence, of course. And Professor William Easterly's work in aid and development helps us understand what it means to live well and what factors either allow us or prevent us from pursuing our aspirations. His work centers on the rights of those whom poverty and aid programs are intended to help and offers profound reasons why technocratic solutions from well-intended experts often fail to alleviate the suffering of the poor. And these reasons include ignoring history, culture, politics, and the ways of life in devastatingly poor communities. Professor Easterly is professor of economics at New York University and co-director of the NYU Development Research Institute. He holds a PhD in economics from MIT and is a graduate of Bowling Green State University. So that's right, he's somewhat of a local. Born in West Virginia and raised in Bowling Green, uh, he tells me he spent time as a kid camping in our beloved Hocking Hills, hiking Old Man's Cave. We are extremely fortunate to hear from him this evening. Please help me welcome Professor William Easterly. Thank you, Court. I'm going to talk to you tonight about a debate on saviors versus liberators, a debate on ending global poverty. This debate has been going on for a while. When I say a while, I mean at least since 1629, when the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, was explaining to potential English settlers their rationale for settling Massachusetts and offering a justification of their rights to the land of Massachusetts. He said, God had not intended a whole continent as fruitful and convenient for the use of man, like the Americas, to lie waste without any improvement. He suggested the settlers bring this improvement in contrast to the local inhabitants who would enclose no land, neither have they any settled habitation nor any tame cattle to improve the land by. So the lack of development of Massachusetts thought to John Winthrop gave him a rationale for developing the land of Massachusetts. This development rationale, this saving of the land for development, also extended to saving the people. John Winthrop suggested that it's true the settlement of the English would only leave the Indians a portion of their lands. He said, but they would learn from us to improve a part to more use than before they could do the whole part. Such a knowledge transfer, such development aid will yield them more benefit than all the land which we have from them. And John Winthrop portrayed on the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony an Indian who had invited them to come over and help us in the little word uh, bubble that comes out uh, of the Indian's mouth in this portrayal, come over and help us. The Indian is portrayed in a peaceful, welcoming fashion to the English settlers. Uh, John Winthrop didn't tell us anything about the name of this Indian or what tribe this Indian belonged to probably because the Indian is entirely fictional. In fact, what happened with development in Massachusetts and with the U.S. as a whole? Well, John Winthrop kept his promise. The development did really happen in the U.S. This is a graph of the U.S. per capita income from the 1600s, from some very crude speculative estimates of what income was like in the 1600s to the present day. We have to graph it on a logarithmic graph in which every unit increase represents a doubling because the increase was so spectacular. So there was a spectacular increase in economic development and reduction in poverty under the English settlement started by John Winthrop. Uh, as far as Native American development, we of course don't have any figures from previous centuries 
we do have a figure today shown by the red bar which shows in Native American income today about 30% less than the American average. But still, if we assume that Native American incomes were in the ballpark of, of the whites' income in the 1600s, that would also represent a spectacular increase in per capita income. So John Winthrop's promises were kept. He developed the land, and it did raise the per capita income of the Indian inhabitants of the land as well. Did that justify the settlement, the taking of the land? Um, one thing that happened soon after Winthrop's arrival is the first war between the English and the Indians broke out. The English went to war with the Peacock tribe that were resisting an English settlement in the Connecticut River Valley. In the crucial battle that decided the war, the English attacked a Pequot village of 400 inhabitants, including 150 women and children. Only five survived the attack. The English sold into slavery some Pequot survivors of the war. They gave others to Indian tribes, and they announced that no more shall any Indians be called Pequots. The English had li literally disappeared the Pequots. So it does not seem like the Pequots benefited from the knowledge transfer John Winthrop had promised. I tell you this story because still today we have a huge puzzle about how we think about reduction in material poverty and material economic development. We usually define development as increased per capita income or reduction in material poverty rates, and this does work well in very many cases. But how do we take into account the violations of human rights that sometimes happen in the name of development? If material incomes are increased, at the same time that there are mar large violations of the rights of those whose income is being increased? Do we call that development? Do we call that progress? How do we struggle with this issue? Well, this issue is one that it really helps to look at the long history of development thinkers to resolve, and that's what I want to do with you tonight. The whites' Indian development efforts continued two centuries later, in the early 1800s. There was a Cherokee preacher named David Brown, who in 1825 was actually celebrating how much Indian development after two centuries after Winthrop had, had been a success among the Cherokees. The Cherokees were producing Indian corn, cotton, tobacco, wheat, oats, indigo, sweet and Irish potatoes, apple and peach orchards, industry, and commercial enterprise are extending themselves in every part. There was success in material development. So was this development a success, according to David Brown from the Cherokees? Uh, not so fast. Uh, Brown says the crucial part, of, the crucial problem with all of this is the Indians had never consented to this material development. Instead, Indians had been driven from their lawful possessions by the white usurpers of their dominions. He celebrated the Indian warriors who had died defending the rights of our country did he think it was all worthwhile for the sake of material development? No, actually, he said, if things had been in America, better it would it have been for the natives had they never seen even the shadow of a white man. At the time that Brown was writing, there was a new struggle over Indian rights, which was the re Indian removal of tribes from the southern United States to lands that they had not asked for on the other side of the Mississippi River. This was going to culminate in the famous Trail of Tears in, the 18, in 1837, 1838, which is the, the map shown here, the paths by which Indian tribes were removed from their possessions east of the Mississippi to lands they did not want west of the Mississippi. And David Brown asked, what would, would, the, would the Georgians call this process? development? Would the, would the Georgians think this was progress? How would Georgians receive a proposition from the Cherokees to exchange the land they now hold for a tract of country they did not want near the Rocky Mountains? Uh, David Brown was very clear that for him, development and progress were not about only material income success, but about rights, about the, the right to consent to your own progress. So the liberal answer, the liberator's answer to the puzzle of defining development 
is those who claim to be developers, those who claim to be reducing someone else's material poverty in the name of those who claim to be achieving economic development, must be constrained by the consent of those they intend to develop, of those they are supposedly developing, must be consenting to that development. So to give you the, the immediate overview of the history of the saviors versus liberators debate, the saviors have a view of, of paternalism, that they know what is best for those that they are saving, uh, but they need to apply coercion because those they know what is best for those they are saving, but the, those they are saving don't seem to appreciate it enough. Uh, this coercion and paternalism conveys on them uh, the right to conquer, the right to take land. It confers no right to consent on the rest. And the liberators were eventually going to offer the opposite of these values. Instead of coercion, there would be consent. Instead of paternalism, there would be self-determination. Instead of unequal rights for the West and the rest, there would be equality of rights. The first liberal in this line that I want to talk about is Adam Smith, who rejected the, this idea of conquest in the name of development in the Americas. He was a big critic, not, not very well known that he was a big critic of the conquest of the Americas and colonization of the rest of the world by, by Europeans. He mocked the conquerors who claimed that, that they had had the pious purpose of converting the locals to Christianity. But instead, Adam Smith said the savage injustice of the Europeans in conquest and settlement had in fact been ruinous and destructive to several of those unfortunate countries. And Adam Smith offered an alternative that today we just think of as Economics 101. He said there could have been a much more benevolent alternative if both sides had consented voluntarily to a new set of exchanges that were made possible by the travel of Europeans in, into the Americas. There could have been a new set of exchanges, Smith said, which should naturally have proved as advantageous to the new world as it certainly did to the old world, to the old continent. So Adam Smith offered a vision of peaceful exchange to which both sides consent as the core liberal value that he offered as an alternative to coercion, paternalism, and inequality. Adam Smith declared his commitment to these liberal values uh, right, aw right away at the beginning in the Wealth of Nations, in which he made clear that the Wealth of Nations was not only uh, a scientific tract on how to achieve material development, but also a moral vision that should underlie economics. He, uh, Smith offered the moral vision, the, the liberal values that he thought should underlie economics. The first one was consent, that whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind in exchange is based on mutual consent. Give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want. Second, this uh, world of mutual consent offers self-determination to each side. I'm not telling you what is best for you. You're not telling you, me what is best for me. Each man decides for himself or herself what they want from the exchange. So in Adam Smith's word, every man is by nature first and principally recommended to his own care. It is fit and right that it should be so. And third, there would be equality in this world of exchange. There would be equal right to consent on both sides of the exchange. Every man as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interests his own way. Everyone would be free to pursue their own choices, and no one would be imposing their, the choices on someone else, as long as everyone refrained from violating the laws of justice. And what's remarkable is Smith was writing at a time of uh, slavery and colonialism and oppression, and yet he had this remarkable vision that someday this world of exchange would come, would offer a much better alternative, that someday his vision would come true. He, he thought of a world where the inhabitants of all the different quarters of the world may arrive at this equality in which the injustice of independent nations would be changed into some sort of respect for the rights of one another. And he saw this process of mutual respect happening indeed this precisely through an extensive commerce from all countries to all countries. 
So the, the second big point that I want to leave with you is how commerce between individuals and nations is a way for everyone to consent to their own progress, to their own development. So this history kept being played out through many, many battles over the rights of the West and the rest. Another one was white American approaches to black poverty before the Civil War, in which somewhat implausibly slave owners were already offering themselves as saviors to their slaves. A very implausible idea, but they seemed to get some takers for this, this, this idea of sa saviorhood, not, not from the slaves, but from other white Americans. Uh, at that time, many in the North and the South supported colonizing of blacks to Liberia, supposedly for their own good and supposedly for the good of Africa as well. Again, did not have a lot of takers among the would-be beneficiaries. But the liberal idea, the liberator's ideas, helped defeat slavery and colonization to Liberia. And then after the Civil War, new battles begun over white ph philanthropy for freedmen, which again raised the savior versus liberator debate. One of the big voices in that debate was Frederick Douglass, who exasperated with the efforts of white saviors, had a kind of like surprising let, let us alone mantra. If you see a, a Negro wanting to purchase land, just let him alone. If you see him on the way to the workshop, let him alone. Let him work, let him make his choices. Frederick Douglass wanted a, a world of free labor and free land markets to replace the coercion of slavery and replace the coercion of, of whites deciding what was best for blacks. And that, importantly, that very much included the political rights to protect the rights to, for blacks to protect themselves from the depredations of would-be white saviors. Let him alone if he has a ballot in his hand. His right of choice is as much, deserves as much respect and protection as your own. And Fred, Frederick Douglass had reached this point out of this exasperation that when you, our white fellow countrymen, have attempted to do anything for us, it has generally been to deprive us of some right deprive us of some power, deprive us of some privilege, which you yourself would die before you would submit to have taken from you. So for Douglas, offering aid without rights was not acceptable. Rights without aid would be better than aid without rights. And Douglas also objected very much to the the sort of humiliating picture of the helpless slave that needed to be, the helpless African American that needed to be rescued by whites. He could not accept this image, the, in his words, of the prostrate form, the uncovered head, the cringing attitude, the suppliant outstretched hand of beggary. It does not become us as American freedmen. We will not consent to, to be any longer represented in that, in that position. Douglas had declared himself throughout his life in his autobiography to be a man, an equal, entitled to all rights, privileges, and dignity. And that word dignity is extremely important for this, this debate between saviors and, and liberators because while saviors might envision that those to be saved only have a need for material consumption, only have a need for material relief from poverty, the liberators understand very much that that human beings are those who have not only material needs for GDP, but also a need for dignity, for basic respect. And for the saviors part of the debate, someone like Douglas would see this combination of coercion, paternalism, and unequal rights as profoundly humiliating to the recipients. Whereas the, a world of consent, self-determination, and equality allowed people to live with dignity. Consent plus self-determination plus equality equals dignity. And so this, this vision of the world fortunately triumphed. At that time, there were moral victories of the black and white liberals, the liberators who adhered to liberal values. They defeated slavery. They defeated the colonization of blacks. They passed the 15th Amendment to give blacks the right to vote. But still, the debate continued over and over and over again. Always the, a new savior would come along offering a new vision, 
of salvation that did not respect the rights of those to be saved. King Leopold of Belgium on Africa in 1876 portrayed himself as wanting to open to civilization the only portion of our globe to which it has not yet penetrated. This led to the Berlin Conference of 1884-85 partitioning Africa in the name of, quote, furthering the moral and material well-being of the native population. Of course, that's not, if you know the history of the Congo, that's not exactly how things worked out for the Congolese that were um, unlucky enough to be part of King Leopold's colony, the Congo Free State. King Leopold's regime in the Congo killed millions of Congolese by forced labor to gather rubber in the late 19th and early 20th century with a ban on free trade in rubber. And this tells us another super important lesson that saviors without the consent of those they are supposedly saving cannot be trusted to act in the interest of those they are supposedly saving. Most important of, a, of all, they can't be trusted not to act in their own self-interest, sometimes ruthless self-interest that can be so destructive. This justification of colonialism in the name of development kept being repeated over and over and over again. In the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I in 1919, the Versailles Treaty noted how some lands are inhabited by peoples allegedly not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world and declare that the well-being and development of such peoples form a sacred trust of civilization. And this was justification for yet further expansions of colonialism in Africa and Asia. But despite all this, the victory of, of the liberators eventually happened. Victory over colonialism eventually happened in rejecting the savior viewpoint in favor of liberators. UNESCO, after the end of World War II, noted how this war had been made, this atrocious war had been made possible by the denial of the democratic principles of the dignity, equality, and mutual respect of men, leading to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 that declared all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And so the, one of the great successes of the liberators was the success of anti-colonialism. The two, two most successful movements, political movements of the last couple of centuries have been anti-colonialism and liberalism, and they offer an awful lot to each other. So the number of colonies achieving independence since 1941 surged after World War II and surged again in the 1960s and was complete, largely completed by the 1970s. And so we, we've seen that despite the, the attractive promises of the saviors, the liberators have so often fortunately won, won the day anyway. So now that takes us to the world of modern development. How is modern development, the modern debate on economic development and fighting global poverty, how has it been affected by this legacy, this historical legacy of saviors versus liberators? Are there still some lingering lingering heritage, heritages of the, the savior viewpoint in modern development? Well, let me start with the bad news. The bad news about modern development is that in many cases after independence, there were aid finance tyrants who replaced the colonial tyrants. And second, that the development world still concentrated mainly, almost only, on material poverty and still paid little attention to the rights of the poor. And to give you some illustration of that, even in, in the recent decades, Development has aid, aid in the, the business of development aid has largely continued to move in the wrong direction on supporting the rights of the poor. It's tended to give money above all to the most tyrannical regimes in the world. If you divide up all the aid recipient countries over the last two decades, according to using World Bank governance measures on political and economic freedom, if you look at the aid increases between 1996-2000 to the new millennium 
uh, those aid recipient countries in the least free quadrant of, of aid recipients got a 300% increase in aid. All other aid recipients got a 35% increase in aid. So there's something going on in aid that still primarily supports the most tyrannical regimes in development. This probably had something to do with the U.S.'s own agenda of fighting the war on terror, in which he want, the U.S. wanted to give a lot of aid to autocratic allies in the war on terror. And it was convenient to kind of have a development rationale for, for doing so. And so once again, we have a case of uh, a would-be savior really acting in their own interest and not in the interest of the poor. The debate on paternalism and aid very much continues. This is a picture that appeared soon after the Haiti earthquake in 2010, when an NGO, and the NGO in this case, was raising money for Haiti quake victims. So this is like sort of the counterpart to the similar picture four centuries earlier of someone saying, come over and help us. This is a Haitian woman with the outstretched hand, you know, seemingly saying, come, come help us. Another po popular picture in, in the aid business is pictures of children, pictures of children who need to be rescued, which is sort of like the literal definition of paternalism, that thinking of children who need to be rescued is literally paternalistic. So this, this is a picture also right after the Haiti earthquake with a picture of, uh, featuring a picture of a child. Uh, 21 of 25 aid agencies, according to a later study, right after the Haiti earthquake, featured children in the, in the appeals to, for, for funds after the Haiti earthquake. It seems like almost nobody in development can resist pictures of children. Uh, I think it's really awful anyone who would use a picture of a child on, on any book that they wanted to publish to put a picture of a child just to sell some books on development is terrible. Um, well, I did change the picture later in the revised edition of the book. So this, this debate on paternalism ha has led to some furious responses. Not everyone shares this extreme aversion to paternalism that this quote represents, but uh, a cons consultant born in Haiti named Marie Rose Ramon Murphy and an NGO executive born in Somalia named Dagon Ali protested vehemently about these, these kind of images and this kind of journalism. They suggest the first step is to immediately seize the marketing of people in the global south as passive beneficiaries of aid who need white saviors. Another vociferous protester of this has been the Senegalese entrepreneur Magat Wade. She wrote about her conversation that she had with a, a would-be investor in Silicon Valley she was, trying, she was a private entrepreneur trying to create jobs in, in Senegal. And she spoke to this venture capitalist who expressed a lot of puzzlement why she would want to do a private enterprise in Senegal. Don't we need, he said, don't we need to be, we, I guess, we, the, the language of we is a very common language in the savior community. Don't we need to be digging wells and creating schools for poor children? For him, helping Africa, in, in, her, in her kind of bitter words, could only mean providing charity for the pathetic African children he had seen in hundreds of NGO marketing campaigns. It's clear this really, really got to her. For, she was offering, like, what about trade? What about voluntary exchange between productive Africans and uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley? She said, she noted that she, she found it really hard to get across this idea of dignity and respect to audiences. She, she did say whenever she speaks about the dignity and respect that Africans deserve to African audiences in the U.S. or in Africa or anywhere, she gets standing ovations. She, they get it. It's because, she said, they, they too feel the pain and disrespect of these stereotypes that hurt Africa's future that leads to investors not wanting to invest in Africa. But conversely, when she says the same thing to Euro-American audiences, she just gets the blank stares, like, but what about digging the wells? 
Well, the good news on modern development is actually the, the thing that the liberators wanted to succeed did succeed. And actually, almost all the interactions between the West and the rest these days are not about development aid. They're not about foreign aid. They're actually about market transactions. So the blue line in this graph is the sum of all of three different kinds of market transactions between low and middle income countries and the rest of the, and the, and the West, the rich countries. The three, the three transactions that I'm adding to each other are first of all remittances from migrants, uh, migrants from developing countries who go to developed countries and then send back large remittances back to their families in the, in the developing countries. Uh, second, foreign direct investment from the West to the rest, the voluntary investment flows in which both sides benefit. And then clearest of all in Adam Smith's vision and, and finally realizing the prediction, the prophecy that Adam Smith had is exports from low, income, low and middle income countries to the rest of the world, to the West, to the, to the rich countries. So these three transactions, as a whole, they sum to almost $10 trillion now. And as you can see, they've sharply increased over this period. Uh, the purple line way at the, hiding way at the bottom is net official development assistance and official aid received. That's, that's foreign aid. So we have these fierce debates about whether foreign aid works or not, but this picture kind of offers a different view. It's like, does it matter whether foreign aid works or not? It's so small relative to what's going on with, with market transactions between developing countries and developed countries, between low and middle income countries and the rich countries. And the, the other parts of Adam Smith's vision in the long run have come true. So the big story in, in the long run in global economic development, it's not only that there was, has been huge progress in material poverty, which there has been, and that's great, and that's a wonderful thing, and everyone who celebrates that, including me, should celebrate that. There's been tremendous, tremendous progress on reducing material poverty, that's great. And where material poverty still does exist, that really is tragic, and that really does need good-hearted efforts by everyone involved to alleviate moral, the, the extreme poverty that still does exist far too much, far, far more than it, than it should exist. That is also a great cause, and, the, and that's a cause that deserves to be celebrated and has already been celebrated a lot over and over again. But we should also support a different kind of progress, the kind of moral progress that has been achieved by liberators by the, the liberator side of the liberators versus saviors debate, the moral revolution that has led a world of consent to largely replace a world of conquest, a world of, of, of consent as re represented by some of the graph lines shown in this, in this graph that show the kind of moral revolution that the liberators have, have achieved over time. So the green line is, the, is an index of the US slave population and that, of course, went suddenly to zero in 1865. The, uh, the red line is the share of countries that uh, had some form of officially condoned forced labor of some kind, slavery or any other kind of serfdom or forced labor. That was uh, prevalent in about 50% of countries in the, at the time that Adam Smith was writing The Wealth of Nations, and that has largely eroded to almost nothing. There still, of course, is forced labor around the world, but it's very seldom officially sanctioned by, by state laws any, any longer. Uh, the yellow line is something else that's been very much in the background of the coercion versus consent debate, and that is uh, men coercing women. The, the yellow line is the share of countries in which women have property rights. That was a shockingly low number. Almost no women had property rights around the world in the 1800s. And today we're in a world where most countries in the world, women, women do have, have property rights. The blue line is the rise and fall of colonialism. The blue line is the share of territories in Africa and Asia that were colonized. So that continued to go up and up and up through the, the period of, through the 1800s and the early 20th century as all these development justifications were for colonialism were being offered. 
But that also ended and anti-colonialism succeeded. And then last of all, the black line shows the explosion of exports from Africa and Asia to the rest of the world. So indeed, Smith's prophecy finally, at least partially, comes true, that a world of commerce has replaced conquest, a world of conquest, a world of consent has replaced a world of coercion. This moral victory is arguably one of the greatest achievements of all of economics and not just the material gains that have been achieved. So the, the last point I'm leaving with today is there already has been a great amount of progress replacing the savior view of the world with the liberator view. But of course we know that's a long way from, that battle is a long way from being over. There's still far too much coercion and, and violence going on in the world, violating the rights of people around the world. So the battle for liberal rights is a long way from over. That includes the battle for economic rights to property and trade. That includes the, the real, really having the principle of equal rights before the law, equal treatment of the, before the law, the political rights that represent the consent of the governed, and most importantly in recent, recent uh, the last couple of years events, rights in international law not to be conquered by another people for any reason in the name of development or for any other reason. And so we can take heart from how much, how many moral victories have already been achieved and yet be a little uh, motivated to continue fighting for the many, many victories that have yet to be achieved. So let me use, borrow the words of, uh, of another eloquent sentence and change them a little bit for my purposes to suggest that what we need to do here is highly resolve that development shall have a new birth of freedom and that development of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. I'll go ahead and bring the mic. Um, one of the things I'm kind of curious about is how the sort of rise of alternative forms of governance and economic structure to sort of like American style liberalism in the last couple of decades um, kind of interplays with this, like say Russia or China um, and their rapid expanses and influence in the last decade or so. I mean, obviously things aren't going so great for the Russians now, but that's sort of besides the point. I guess what I'm kind of asking is, is this, this sort of future that Smith envisioned that has been at least mostly realized now, would you characterize it as being under threat by outside forces or, or internal forces? Um, you know, how, how do we make sure that uh, things are going in the right direction and stay in the right direction when things, uh, you know, that are kind of out of our control are going on elsewhere? Uh, yeah. Things are not, not necessarily all going in the right direction. And liberal values are always, always under threat. And, um, so I think that at least we can say that uh, these major victories were already were already achieved. That from that we can take heart. But there, there's always like new forms of tyranny coming coming along that threaten that threaten that system. My name is Mahmoud Mohamed. I'm an international student from Ghana. Yeah, that was an interesting presentation. I'm particularly interested about uh, modern development. Like, uh, you presented here showing that uh, uh, the market relationship or trade relationship between Africa or developing countries and the developed are actually skyrocketing. Yeah, but uh, in the context of rights, yeah, between development and uh, the uh, uh, theories of, of life of the poor. Ghana is one of the, uh, I think, the second uh, leading producers of cocoa, yet Ghanaians don't get to decide how much they sell their cocoa for, as well as other resources. Quite recently, 
buscate the uprising in, uh, 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 in Niger that has to do with the uranium, that they do not have right to price, right? Uh, the French rather decide on uh, how much they buy uh, an ounce of uranium, which is part of the international markets uh, prices. So I would like to know why is this so uh, 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 right for the developer to, to set standards or to decide on how much they buy their resources, their natural resources from developing countries? Yeah, so a uh, 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 pay of theories of the right of the poor, how would you explain that scenario? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Uh, so, you know, rights uh, very much require both uh, free competition, not, not having a monopoly power of any kind from the rich or from the French or from you know, uh, rich country markets, whatever, to set the price of commodities. And commodities prices be freely determined through international trade in which there, there is no coercion, there is no arm twisting. So I, I agree with you that any kind of interference with the market, the market price that dictates a sort of dis distorted or artificial price to any country is a violation. Hi, thanks a lot. I'm Neon Kim in geography. And uh, the way I see development is that I still think that there should be a lot more pollen aid from developed economies to low income countries in Africa. And I grew up in South Korea and the to South Korea economy during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, aid played a key role in the early development of the economy. So I was wondering whether the, that kind of help had been given to African countries that could have achieved a similar level of economic success. So, that's why I think based on my own experience, I think aid could still do a lot more in Africa. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, a long time ago, I did a, a study in which uh, there was a model of how aid was supposed to raise economic growth, called the big push. So aid was equal to investment, and then investment would be growth, and there would be this big increase, and you could sort of calibrate how much given on how much farming had been given to each country, uh, how much growth had turned out that way to achieve a big push in response to aid, to investment increase and growth increase and all that. And out of 128 countries, there's only one, one country that actually fits the team of that model in which they would have this wonderful positive effect on long-run growth. And that one country was South Korea. So you're, you're very fortunate to be from the, the one country where where things did work out, did work out well. Uh, and even then, uh, if, if it's only one out of 128, I don't think scientifically we could say necessarily that, that, was, that it was necessarily that, that achieved a miracle in South Korea. Uh, and the timing in South Korea is not even that supportive of that, because the aid increased a lot in the, the 50s, and then the takeoff came after the decrease of aid, not before the increase of aid. So, you know, I wish I, I respect your viewpoint a lot. I, I, from what I've seen in the numbers, it mostly comes out in a different way from, from most other countries. That it has not shown a lot of success achieving that. Well, at the same time, it has led to a lot of uh, support of, of tyrannical governments and support of, of rights violations. So I, I, I respectfully disagree. I have a much less positive. Thank you, that was an interesting talk. This may be a bit um, more philosophical than you're interested in discussing, but it seems to me that, at least from a savior's point of view, it may not be that, well, the liberators clearly think that freedom and autonomy is a good in itself, in a certain sense, and the 
saviors, at least as you construe them, seem to be a sort of hedonistic group or focused entirely on material utility. Whereas one might say, hmm, these saviors believe in freedom and so forth. They just believe, um, this maybe what you want to say, that um, some people just aren't ready for freedom, just as children are not ready for the full autonomy. There's an age limit to the principle of liberty, for example, in Mill, and he does particularly mention certain groups of people he regards as being um, not ready, or in some sense not, uh, to, to offer them freedom would be to their own great detriment. And I just wanted to see if you could speak to that sort of mm, philosophical view about what the saviors may be, the mistake may be, they're making. Yeah, um, I know that quote from John Stuart Mill that you're referring to is kind of a heartbreaking quote for his, for someone who, I mean, he was otherwise uh, a good liberal. He, he played a very important role in the fight, the fight against slavery, uh, helped defeat kind of the support of the British government that could have happened, the, it could have happened that the British government supported the Confederacy, but he Mill helped defeat that and helped uh, very much support the moral argument in which other classical economists were very important. Some of them not as well known, like Harriet Martineau, another classical economist at the time of Mill, who fought very much against slavery. But I think liberals always have this kind of uh, ambiguity. Not all of them, but some of them have this ambiguity. Like, but you know, doesn't uh, don't liberal values require kind of some instant solution? Can we just sort of parachute in liberal values? as quickly as possible, and that some of them deluded themselves that colonialism could do that. But of course, colonizers that are acting in their own interest cannot be trusted to kind of like enforce liberal restrictions on themselves, on their own ability to violate the rights of those that they are governing. And just, it's just not consent, this not consent compatible, consent is not compatible for that, for that outcome. So I think the, the saviors who kind of fool themselves that they're, they're sort of helping some people sort of grow up until they, they're ready for freedom, I think more often than not those were very self-serving arguments for their own interests. And they were, those, those arguments also presume that, uh, you know, that the saviors were, were, were actually capable of achieving these, these great things for those that are supposed to save, and they were deluding themselves like they should have been asking, not are those people fit to be free, but are we fit to coerce them? That's the question that some liberals finally realize they should be asking. Not like, are they fit to be free, but are we as aspiring colonizers, are we fit to coerce them? No, we're not fit to coerce them. Uh, do we want freedom for ourselves? Yes, we want freedom for ourselves. Do we want someone else to treat us like children until we're ready for freedom for ourselves? No, we don't. Once you start answering those questions, then, then you're kind of then pointing in the right direction towards being a liberator and not a saint. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I had two questions. The first was on the matter of uh, aid and coercion, which you attached to each other in your uh, slideshow. And I was a little confused as to why uh, aid and coercion are necessarily connected, specifically aid after something like an earthquake in Haiti, where it's not specifically uh, earmarked for some sort of use and development that seems to be response to a particular problem. Uh, and I'm broadly sympathetic about being critical of NGOs, but I have to say I'm not sure how it's distinct from remittances in kind, uh, just because they're not related to the people they're donating the money to. It, it seems like a relatively similar thing. On the other end, there's this problem of um, liberal rights, uh, historically in the anti-colonialist movement, not being connected with the liberal movements. So, for instance, uh, Pinochet comes in with a kind of free market approach, but does not come in with personal rights. Uh, meanwhile, most, or at least the plurality of the anti-colonialist movements of the second half of the 20th century are overtly maliced. Uh, so they certainly don't believe in free markets. So those two things seem kind of disjoint. I think that's a, that's a really helpful set of questions there. So first of all, uh, is aid automatically coercive? No, no. So I think it is. Uh, I think this kind of historical perspective kind of helps us concentrate on the right thing. Not, not should there be aid, but 
Should there be coercive aid or should there be consensual aid? Coercive aid is aid that sort of takes place in the context of being given to support a tyrannical regime, or aid that is given specifically under under rules that, that do not prevent violating the rights of the poor. So the, like there's a, an example that uh, in, in an aid project in Uganda in which the aid project entailed specifically taking farmers' land away from them and turning it over to their forestry company and farmers saw in the name of aid their, their livestock were killed, their houses were torn down, and they were marched to gunpoint to live somewhere else. That's coercive aid. Not all aid is like that. There can be consensual aid that's just giving cash grants for people to do with what they want. That's much more consensual. So that's the question is not should there be aid, but should it be consensual or coercive? And then on the uh, the disjuncture between liberalism and anti-colonialism, I think you're you're totally right. The, the point is, uh, it should a consistent liberal should be in favor of anti-colonialism because it's consistent liberal should be averse to any kind of coercion of, of you know, a, a paternalistic power of another people in the name of development, in the name of salvation of, of that other people. And that should include all, all examples of colonial, colonial regimes that have that, that have that mindset of saving other people and denying them their rights to, to determine their own future. And did anti all anti-colonial forces embrace li liberalism? No, very much not. And I fear that some of the hypocrisy of, of the West on, on liberalism kind of like prefigured, kind of predestined that outcome. That the anti-colonial forces have seen how much the West had violated its own principles of liberalism and liberty, equal liberty for all. And so they turned much more to kind of the, the anti-colonial uh, powers like Russia that were, was offering, you know, a very violent form of rebellion against colonialism. Uh, you know, Lenin got uh, a lot more traction than he should have because at the time of the Versailles Treaty when the Wilson and the West was offering this paternalistic image of, of uh, childlike image of pe poor people being saved by the West, Lenin was calling for, you know, equality of nations and self-determination. And that was one point in which this sort of battle for the hearts of the anti-colonial movement was lost. So this is sort of tragic loss that has happened that not enough liberals are anti-colonial, not, not enough anti-colonials are liberal. That didn't need to happen, but it did happen because precisely of this history of hypocrisy that we, we had had through in fighting for liberal values. And your example of Pinochet is an example of this. I think uh, that was one of the great kind of uh, mistakes that I think Milton Friedman made that in, uh, in kind of fighting for liberal values is, that, is being willing to kind of talk to Pinochet and have his, Friedman's advice on liberal values kind of injected into a very autocratic system. That was, I think, inconsistent with Milton Friedman's own, own value that he expressed elsewhere in his writing. So I'm, uh, sadly enough, the liberal cause depends on very, very poor human beings <laughs> that are very inconsistent, very hypocritical, and very, very, very unable to kind of consistently com commit to what all of us have the most trouble with, which is being enthusiastic about the rights of other people. It's easier to be enthusiastic about our own rights, but to be enthusiastic about the rights of other people seems to require a lot more of us than most of us can handle. So that's that's a tragedy. But still, we keep fighting for this kind of unity of anti-colonial and liberal forces that is, has already been happening and will still happen even more, I hope, in the future. Um, I guess, kind of going back to our idea on, uh, on this, uh, the black and brown self-interest, uh, looking into the idea of like, free markets and capitalism, uh, how, how might that kind of play into the idea that like, you know, people are acting in markets in their own self-interest, uh, or the sort of like a for-profit model, you know, that a lot of what they're used to advance uh, sort of self interest. How can they kind of like, uh, I guess, sort of advance uh, the idea of why it's uh, taking development without sort of just like assuming that we're just going to act in good faith? Well, of course, that's the, that's the great uh, contribution of Adam Smith at the very beginning, uh, 50 years ago almost, that, um, that uh, self interest can be 
and be a positive force. The, the key for Adam Smith and the key for economics ever since has been, you know, if the conditions exist under which uh, self-interest and the public interest are consistent with each other, then markets are an enormously powerful force for, for a lot of good to be achieved. Because people will have to act and so energetically in their own self-interest will then unintentionally, as with the great idea of the invisible hand, be benefiting everyone else. So, you know, when, when uh, Steve Jobs, you know, invents the iPhone and reaps enormous prof profits from the iPhone, he does so because there's, he's doing something in the public interest as well, in the social interest, because everyone wants an iPhone. The markets are aligned in that case for you know, his own private return being very much a public return. Uh, coercion is precisely what Violet is, is the thing that is most likely to create a di disjunction between private interest and public interest. So when King Leopold in the Congo is acting in his own self-interest, to be uh, you know, violently forcing the Congolese at gunpoint to, to gather rubber and turn it over to him for free and with forced labor, then that, that violence is, that is what is creating an enormous wedge between his own self-interest and, and the public interest. If, uh, if Leopold and everyone else had just been uh, you know, allowing the Congolese if they wanted to to gather rubber and sell it to the world market in a consensual way, that would have you know, benefited both sides, the Congolese and, and, and uh, the Western markets. So violence and coercion is precisely the thing that is what disrupts the, con the, the, the connection between the public, my, my self-interest, and, and the interest of everyone else. Of course, there are other market conditions that can go wrong. There could be monopoly. There could be uh, externalities like pollution or global warming or whatever. They require other interventions markets to create market, market failures, but where, where those conditions, where the conditions are, uh, are consistent with competition and freedom of choice and consent, and most of the time, you know, self-interest and public interest are, are able to be reconciled. And that's how most of the good being accomplished in the world today is actually, is actually happening. Uh, in your mind, how can we as individuals strike a balance between helping others and preserving their dignity? That's a, a wonderful question. It's, I mean, the first answer is it's hard. It's not. It's a lot easier not to worry about dignity. And I confess, a lot, a lot of my career was spent not worrying about dignity. But, uh, you know, in the situation in which I was working on problems of poor people. Um, I think you know it's a lot of it. A lot of the sort of guidelines of dignity is helped by this kind of application of the reciprocity principle. I'm you know, just think how, how would I think about uh, how would I think about the, whether this process was dignified if it was being done to me. You know, so like how would I think about my my child being used on the on the cover of a book? Without you know my my permission or the, my permission as the parent or the child's permission, and that's actually an argument that is what persuaded me to take the picture of the child off the book and put a picture of adults on the, on the next edition edition of the book. And I I think that's that sort of reciprocity principle is a good way to kind of think of what is consistent with dignity. It's not like helping people are is automatically leads to loss of dignity. I don't think that's true. I think there's a way to help people in which they consent. They're consulted about whether they want that help and they're okay with the form of the help. And you know, all of us every day ask, ask for help from those around us in different ways and don't automatically think it violates our right. Thank you very much, Phil. We much appreciate bringing your expertise and, and telling your story about your experiences in helping the poor. We appreciate adding to uh, what we're trying to do with the forum and thinking about not only you know, living well as material benefits, but dignity, rights, and opportunities to pursue our creative ambitions and aspirations. So one more time.